And I can't help but thinking that a lot of the policy early on was based on models. Yes. Based on things that were completely kind of separated out from reality. And, you know, of course, it turns out that a lot of the the suppositions, a lot of the sort of variables that were introduced into the models were just simply orders of magnitude wrong. Yes. But there's this kind of, I, I can't help but thinking that is there kind of an ascendancy of people who function using these types of methods instead of having to deal with reality. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and those people making decisions because they believe that those types of structures actually you know, work better or it's just, just that's, that's their bias because they work in modeling and they, and they believe that, that that's the way that, that you can come up with good, good answers. So, yeah. yes, it's a very good point and there are a few things to say. Uh, first, I think part of the draw of the model, the seduction of the model, is that it seems to be a way to simplify what is an incredibly complex reality, particularly now when we have this bombardment constantly with information through the internet, social media, everything, right? And you need, again, heuristics as a human mind, you need heuristics to cope with all of this. And if someone comes and says, okay, here I've, I've reduced all of this complexity into this simple model, right? It's very seductive. And this is one of the reasons why not just politicians, but even scientists get sucked in to the idea that these very narrow, very uh, heavily uh, laden with assumptions, kinds of stylized versions of reality are just as good as actually coming to terms with all of reality. And so most scientists these days, even in economics, but also in other fields, will have a very narrow focus. They, they, they study one particular kind of event or phenomenon or, or feature in a particular kind of context, and they publish in that area. They've specialized there. They get their publications, and that's their job, to, to, to do that very narrow focus. The broad-minded scientist, whether it's in social science or in hard sciences, is a, is a rare species these days. Right? So, I mean, that, that is just, and that, that is kind of the way I think of myself and, and a couple of others, certainly Paul Freiders and a couple of other people in this, in this you know, resistance mix are you know, people who have, we may have specialty areas, but we also are interested in and we want to think about the broader society. And of course, it takes a lot of effort in the brain. You know, you're constantly having to weigh up, okay, well, eh, I, have to, I have to somehow reduce this part, but I don't want to reduce it too much because I want to keep some of the complexity. And you know, you're, you're constantly going around with this model of the whole world in your head. But the simulations of how virus X, or, you know, COVID or whatever else, and, and previously and with you know, HONN1 and you know, the other viruses, we've done the same thing. These models of how they would propagate throughout the species and this focus on r naughts and all these other things, right? The first, the first fallacy is there's nothing else in that model except the viral transmission, right? And all the outcomes from the virus. Forget about cost of lockdowns, right? Forget about cost of trying to mitigate the spread. There's nothing in those models about costs. We live in an era of censorship and disinformation, and it can be really hard to know what's true and what's false in this information climate. To get honest information and insights you can trust, join us on Epoch TV. You can sign up for your 14-day free trial at ept.ms slash free trial yan. That's ept.ms slash free trial jan. So it's inherently an uneconomic exercise. That's point one. Right? Secondly, yes, as you said, there are so many assumptions in there about, you know, the fraction that need to be, you know, immune in order to slow this to that, or how much are we going to have, you know, and it's just, it's just judgment calls all over the place. And they have been wrong in the past, right? Previous epidemiological simulations have been wildly off. And this time, not surprisingly, they were off again, right? And, and even if you excuse it in the first few months, even if you excuse the reliance on these simulated models, right? After the data start coming in, after we had the princess, you know, the diamond princess and the, the ruby princess, we have these examples of what happens when a virus circulates in a closed environment. How many people actually die? How many people actually get sick? How much, I mean, we could have learned so much from those if we would just look at the data. But there was not any updating, right, during this process. And again, science is about updating, always. Here's new information. Does it fit with your theory? Does it fit with your predictions? If not, modify theory. Because data is data. Like, that's what is happening in the real world. And this is how I came up with the counterfactuals and all of the other estimates for my cost-benefit analysis. I was not relying on a simulated model. I was relying on what has happened in different places in the world with this virus. 
you know, we have a, a saying in economics, all models are wrong and some are useful, right? All models are wrong is the most important part of that phrase. And, and it's because we just don't know a huge amount about viruses and people's resistance to them. And, and there's so much we don't know that it is, a, it is a fool's errand to expect that building a simulated model is going to give you something that is superior to just looking at what's happening in the world, particularly after you've had a few months to look at what's happening in the world and, again, update your actions. But by that point, you know, March, April, May, June of 2020, politicians were already on this line of, okay, we've got to go to the lockdowns and the, and the control of the transmission and undoing that, right? And it would basically would have for them been very politically difficult. And that's why I then say we, we, we have been seeing for two years now politics, not public health. Maybe it was public health at the start a little bit. But a kind of a hyper-politicization almost, right? Exactly. That's what I'm thinking. But, but I want to talk about that a little more, but I'm just remembering listening to this. I think it was a UK modeler who was talking, and, and, his, and this was fascinating to me because it also spoke to something terribly wrong in the system. Yeah. He said, you know, it, I mean, this is extreme paraphrase, okay? But roughly he said, I, yeah, I overestimated that's okay somehow, but I definitely couldn't have underestimated. I mean, roughly, like that wouldn't have been acceptable. Yeah, right. He felt right. that was un. Uh, what What is that? Well, that's it's right? the same thing we have with meteorologists, right? Where they, if they think there's any chance of rain, maybe you know, ten percent or more, they'll put on the forecast rain, right? Because they don't want to be caught out having predicted that it's going to be sunny, and so people plan for picnics or time outdoors, and then it rains, right? Because then people blame them more. It's the same thing with. The modelers, I think, right? If they are found out afterwards to have underballed, right, lowballed the estimates of people dying from a particular new threat, it makes them look casual and and you know unconcerned about the most important thing, which is you know people dying, right? Because that's the thing being looked at in those models, mm. rather than people dying from anything else, right? That we that we could invest in minimizing through other kinds of expenditures, other than you know the lockdowns, the masks, the whatever we were doing about COVID. We could have expended money on, on trying to promote people's health in other ways, right? But, but we didn't do that, and we spent the money instead on this other stuff. And again, that, that, that economic trade-off is just nowhere in any of these models, and it is nowhere in their incentives, in the incentives that are given to these simulated model runners. And so, yeah, I think that's exactly right. They, they do have a tendency, an incentive, to go for the more extreme estimates. Because also then, yeah, they're going to get more attention, right? I mean, everybody at some level, wants status, power, money, you know, attention. And this is a good way to get it. If you can scream about, oh my God, there are going to be lots of people dying. And look, my special fancy, you know, scientific model says so, right? A lot of people are going to be sucked in by that. A lot of people don't understand it. <laughs>